Well, welcome uh, everybody watching to this next uh, roundtable chat from the concourse virtual. Uh, and I'm happy to say we're talking about the Art Deco era. So an interesting era. And I've got two uh, excellent people joining me to have that discussion. But first to introduce myself, uh, my name is Richard Charlesworth. And even if you haven't bumped into me at a classic event, you may have heard me over the PA as Master of Ceremonies for the Quail, a motorsports gathering, uh, or as the curator and presenter of the Concourse of Elegance at Hampton Court Palace or at the London Concourse. Uh, I'm also an established Concourse judge and well known perhaps to my association with Bentley Motors, having worked for the company since, since 1974. Most recently as the Director of Royal and VIP Relations, Head of the Heritage Collection and as a brand ambassador. Um, but welcome as well to Simon Taylor. Simon was editing the magazine Autosport by the age of 23 and then as managing director of Haymarket magazines he launched titles like Classic and Sports Car, What Car and F1 Racing and took over the world's oldest car magazine, Autocar. He also commentated for over 20 years on F1 for BBC Radio and ITV and he's now editor at large of Classic and Sports Car, a concourse judge and a successful entrant too, netting trophies at Pebble Beach and Stanley Privé. Now in his garage are a 1950 HWM, which he's raced in the UK, uh, the USA and Australia, and a lovely Gurney Nutting Derby Bentley Sedanka and an ACA. So you're very welcome, Simon. I'm delighted also to tell you about uh, Duccio Lopresto. Now Duccio was born into a car family and developed a taste for beauty and design, thanks to his father, Corrado, a renowned collector of Italian one-off and prototypes. He worked for Lamborghini, for RM Sotheby's and Haggerty before joining the Classic Car Trust, where he currently sits on the management committee and is part of the editorial board of The Key. His experience as a judge started in Pebble Beach in 2019, where he teamed as a young apprentice in the Zagato post-war class and has since judged at Salon Privé, Audrains and several others. So you're both welcome, Simon. Duccio, thank you very much for joining me. Now, we're going to have a look at the cars themselves um, quite soon because we do, I think it's 14 cars in this class and all of them are astonishing. So we'll get kicked off. Now, Simon, I'll start with you, if I may. We've recently discussed, minutes ago, the flamboyant styling that came out of the golden era of Detroit. So would you say that Art Deco style is, is Europe's answer to Detroit? Well, I think it's probably the other way around. I mean, it's <laughs> maybe chicken and egg, but... What was happening in Europe in the 1930s was enormously influential and mainly it was innovative. Yeah. As we've seen after the war, Detroit really went its own way until there were cross influences. We were talking about Pin and Farina designing cars for Nash and then for, for General Motors. But Europe was doing something very different with their Art Deco cars to uh, what was happening in Detroit. Detroit was driven by the market. They wanted to make money very sensibly. They were interested in selling cars and therefore they wanted, if you like, the automotive equivalent of bums on seats. They needed numbers. Whereas the Art Deco movement in the 1930s was very much for beauty, for styling, for its own sake. And then, of course, it influenced more affordable cars. But it was a movement towards true art, in my view. Uh, those cars were pieces of art at their best. And I don't think they were really influenced by Detroit, which was actually not doing anything terribly exciting, was it, in the 1920s and 30s, with a few exceptions. We've yeah. got in this class, of course, the Chrysler Aeroflow. Um, we've also got the, the um, Lincoln Continental. But um, I, I would think that the Art Deco movement was very much standing on its own feet in the 1930s. I mean, to a degree, and Simon, just to stay with you, that it, in a way, and this is an oversimplification, it's about making an aerodynamic shape and, and making it beautiful. So, um, you know, was there a link between car and aircraft uh, design in any way in Europe as there, one in the, as there was in the US? Well, as I said, when we were talking about America, I think that was a sort of styling and marketing thing that aircraft were glamorous, aircraft were fast, aircraft were sexy. And so we then got tail fins on American cars and so on. Um, I don't think that aerodynamics per se played a part 
in trying to make the cars more efficient. As I say, there were exceptions and obviously Chrysler were going to the wind tunnel. Um, but when you had a car like, for example, that wonderful uh, Lance Field Elvis, mm. the tail end is beautifully streamlined and one could say it's aerodynamic. But at the front, you have a big chromium radiator, you have big P100 headlights. Obviously, the Alfa Romeo that we're going to look at in a minute was aerodynamic. But I wonder whether that aerodynamic styling wasn't to make the car quicker in a straight line. It was to make it turn heads and look beautiful. Yeah, and it, and it worked. I mean, Duccio, coming to you, they, you can see from the entry, and we'll talk about the entry, and it's a very eclectic mix. And, and as I say, they have one common denominator, which is they're all astonishingly good looking. But yeah. Yeah, there was a healthy competition, Duccio, between mainly, not uniquely, between Italy and France. But who do you think did it best? Yeah, difficult question, but uh, of course, the Art Deco movement uh, uh, was born in France. So uh, I would say that France uh, is the uh, country with the highest production of uh, uh, beautiful Art Deco cars uh, and uh, possibly the, the best examples. But uh, uh, we shouldn't forget that all uh, European countries, but also in the US, uh, we have examples of beautifully aerodynamic uh, Art Deco cars. Uh, and also that, uh, you know, most of the uh, famous uh, designers of the Delage, Talbot Lago, uh, and the beautiful French cars uh, were Italians. I mean, Figon and Falaschi were two Italians who uh, went to France uh, to design cars. Uh, same as for uh, Mario Revelli di Beaumont, who designed this beautiful uh, Alfa Romeo 1750 Aprile, but not only that car. Um, so who did it best? I would say... Uh, in, in general, the Art Deco period is, is a French movement, and I would say France uh, uh, takes the lead. Uh, but uh, we, we have examples from uh, Alfa Romeo, uh, from Mercedes. Uh, we shouldn't uh, forget the right. beautiful uh, Mercedes-Benz SSK uh, that is owned by Ralph Lauren, uh, the, the, the car designed for Count Trossi. Mm. We, uh, other cars like the Alfa Romeo 6C 2.5, uh, uh, always designed by Mario Revelli for Bertone. Uh, so different examples for, for, from different countries. Who did it best? I would say France uh, historically, but uh, Italy, Germany, other countries had their roles too. Yeah, sure. And I think when you look at the timing of this, the, 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 the era kind of... I guess we think of it coming to an end at the start of the Second World War. And I was going to say, some of Europe's greatest designers and stylists were lost in the Second World War. Oh, yeah. um, so do you think this stopped the Art Deco movement from continuing after the war or not? Um, I, I believe uh, every, every movement has uh, its own time. Uh, the Art Deco movement uh, uh, is a movement that basically ended at the end of the 30s. Uh, also because of the war, but also because new design elements, new design uh, uh, movement took over after that. Uh, to say, to talk about the Art Deco uh, after the war would be like talking about uh, Caravaggio in the 20th century. Yeah. I mean, the Art Deco movement after the war became a little bit obsolete, a little bit old. If you think about the uh, Cisitalia 202, for example, designed by Pininfarina, in 1947, that car was uh, simply revolutionary and uh, uh, completely different from what we saw in, during the 30s in France uh, or in, in, in that period. So um, yes, I mean, it, it, it ended uh, up, uh, during the, uh, at the end of the 30s, uh, but uh, you know, the Art Deco period is a French period, the, uh, you know, after the war, uh, we saw the rise of uh, the Italian coach builders. Yeah, now Simon, you, you mentioned the uh, the Alvis uh, there, and, and there are there's a number of uh, English marks represented here, Alvis in particular, but you, they, you obviously feel they deserve to be there. Well, of course. I mean, it's quite interesting that the English coach builders arrived at Art Deco from a completely different starting point, because the great British coach builders were primarily building cars for Rolls Royce, for Bentley, for Daimler. They were building big dignified limousines and so on. 
Um, so they were kind of left behind, as it were, and it was only during the 30s when some of the wealthier uh, people, maybe buying Bugattis in chassis form, certainly buying um, Alvis, uh, maybe Derby Bentley, they looked at what was happening on the other side of the channel and they wanted to copy it. And the smaller uh, British coach builders, people like Carlton or Bertelli, as we're going to see in the list yeah. of cars here, um, they, because they were small, they were able to be much more inventive uh, and build one-off cars which were outside uh, the tradition of H.J. Mulliner or Gurney Nutting or all of the traditional coach builders. But something we haven't touched on yet, and it's not something I can speak on with any sort of expertise, but it's obviously significant. We're talking about Art Deco purely as it impacts on motor cars. Yes. Because Art Deco was a much bigger movement. It, it covered architecture, it covered furniture, it covered, of course, uh, art itself. And that, in a way, is fascinating. Um, Richard, you were talking about to what extent did aircraft design influence car design. What we're seeing in the Art Deco movement shortly and, shortly, and Art Deco cars is that it's motor car styling being influenced by art of its time, by architecture, by clothing fashion. Um, and as Duccio says, by the time we got to the 40s, we got out of World War II, the world had moved on and Art Deco was finished. And the buildings that were being built after the war for all sorts of reasons for, of commerce as well as anything else, no longer looked like Art Deco, their interiors, those wonderful Art Deco interiors, uh, were no longer being made. Mm. And what fascinates me is that if you park an Art Deco car outside an Art Deco building, and you have a beautiful lady sitting on the bonnet, dressed in 1930s clothes, that's where you get the complete Art Deco experience. I think, well, well there's a thought. Uh, I think we should uh, have a look at some of the cars. Duccio, tell us a bit about this. This is a 1931 Fiat 525, I believe this is, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this had a great racing pedigree, uh, as well as being named one of the five most beautiful cars of all time by American Automotive Quarterly. So that's quite, a, quite an accolade. That's quite a statement, yeah. Uh, and indeed, I, I, I agree with the statement, uh, especially if you think that, you know, uh, this car was built and designed in 1931. And for that time, uh, it was very uh, kind of futuristic and very well proportioned, very aerodynamic. Uh, um, and uh, I have a, a, you know, this car is uh, extremely rare. Uh, the, the only one, the, the real one is owned by uh, FCA Heritage, so owned by Fiat. There are a few others uh, uh, around which are not uh, the, the real ones. Um, why this car is so beautiful? I mean, uh, compared to the uh, normal 525, uh, Mario Revelli here designed an uh, extremely elegant but sporty uh, and aerodynamic uh, body at the same time. Um, you know, uh, at the time, uh, Agnelli commissioned this car uh, and uh, to Mario Revelli, but Revelli said that the, the chassis of this car was, uh, was too high uh, of, the, of the original Fiat. Uh, but Valletta, the president of Fiat, refused to change and invest more money uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the development of the chassis to make it uh, lower. Uh, but at the end, Agnelli, and you know, Valletta in, in that time was like the Marchionne uh, of 10 years ago, so a very influential, important person in Italy. At the end, uh, Valletta uh, had to you know, uh, go in favor of Revelli because he was such a talented designer uh, that at the end he came up with this beautifully uh, elegant uh, body. Uh, but uh, this car was also designed for racing. I mean, uh, the, the, the body is extremely aerodynamic, uh, clean, uh, and uh, it started, uh, you know, the movement of the Art Deco uh, in Italy. So it's a, it's a beautiful example. Really. Light, light, lightweight as well, I believe, wasn't it? Yes, it's a lightweight, a carrozzeria leggerita. Uh, it's a super compressa SS. Uh, so it's a sportier uh, version of the of the normal 5 to 5 engine, uh, six cylinder, and uh, it also won a few races. So it has also a, a quite a, a racing pedigree. Yes, 
Yeah, and I saw that. I mean, Simon, there's hints, you did a couple of, on the side view only, a couple of English sports cars that, that come to mind as well. Yes, but <clears throat> it's all in the detail. We just saw front view of that car. And of course, superficially, it's a 1930s sports car with flowing front mudguards. But when you look at the car from the front, I don't know if Duccio can just find that picture. The, uh, there it is. Now, the, the, the design of the line that goes from the front wings down to the front apron is absolutely exquisite. Mm. And when you look at all the great coach builders, the great designers, it's in the detail. It's getting every curve harmonious and so you can make a statement and you know that that car hasn't come down an assembly line uh, it's actually been produced by a master yeah. uh, and it's interesting that as Duccio said I mean it won the Coppa dell'Alpi um, it was a very effective competition car yeah, beautiful a great a great start I, I, if we'll look at some other cars as well but could see if you can find the 1938 Delage this is just astonishing Oh yeah, this one, Pebble Beach, uh, best of show, a few years ago. Yeah, it was '96. It was it was yeah. a Pebble Beach winner. Um, I mean, as with all these car, every car, every car in the virtual concourse, actually, they have a great backstory. But but tell me what you know about this, Duccio. I mean, this is just an astonishing looking thing. This is straight from the designer's pen onto the road, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is probably one of the best examples of uh, French uh, pre-war cars. Uh, uh, ever. Uh, one of the most important uh, uh, manufacturer, one of the most important engines of the 30s uh, uh, and the design of this car is so aerodynamic, uh, is airplane inspired in a way as you see from the fins, the rivets uh, um, and, and the, the very long nose, uh, the long bonnet of the car. Uh, it's uh, just a mix of elegance, sportivity, um, you know aerodynamics uh, it's probably it's one of the best things you can uh, you can see at uh, talking about art deco cars and delage was extremely uh, relevant in the 30s uh, very uh, expensive cars uh, built uh, custom made uh, for special clients uh, like this car and uh, yes what, what i can say i mean it's just uh, unbelievably beautiful it makes a very interesting comparison you've got two uh, D8 Delage is on your list. Um, th that, of course, is De Villar and it's an open car. Uh, the Latour and Marchand car, I don't know if Duccio can find the picture of that, makes an intriguing comparison because, of course, it's closed. Um, and in many ways, for the Art Deco designers, it was easier, um, or maybe not easier, but it was a different set, a different set of um, requirements to make a closed car and I love this car particularly because of the pillarless construction so mm. behind the door there isn't there is no pillar you just have the overlapping sheets of glass sure. um, and that curve which is echoed by the side you, you've got the curve going down that side molding you've got the curve at the top of the door you've got the curve um, going over the roof and the angle of the uh, return behind the, 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 rear win the rear side window is absolutely perfect. It's what we were talking about earlier about detail. It would be so easy to spoil that car by getting one of those lines, one of those parallels slightly wrong. But of course, the Tourneur in Marchand did it right. Yeah. Duccio, anything you want to say about this before we look at something else? It is. <coughs> This is just, yeah, it's just stunning. I, I, I mean, especially also the, the color combination that they decided to use uh, uh, is very particular, very, um, it fits perfect with this car. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just another perfect example of the Art Deco period, this car. Um, unbelievable. I mean, there's not a single de detail that I would change. And uh, the mix of everything, I know another component uh, characteristic of the, uh, Ardico cars is that they are kind of full of, uh, you know, details. Uh, but at the end, all together, they look nice. I mean, as compared to the 40s or 50s car where uh, they were more clean uh, and there is this uh, kind of uh, uh, willingness to become more, uh, yeah, like a unique shape. Uh, 
here all the components uh, together makes a, a nice uh, a nice mix. If I could make a suggestion, Richard, we, yeah. we've we've compared <clears throat> excuse me we've compared two delages, a open and a closed one. Um, there are two Alvises yes in the list, both with English coach builders, uh, Lancefield and uh, Bertelli, and. They're both attacking the same problem, and I think one of them succeeds much better than the other. There's the Bertelli one, which um, it's, it's an interesting car in that it's a two-door coupe, but when you see it side on, uh, the doors seem to me to be the same size as they were on the conventional four-door Alvis. Yes. And in my view that's that's a detail that kind of spoils the car you see that the rear side window yeah looks True. disproportionately large because the door is so short and who knows why that was done um but it, it's a lovely shape it's a fastback shape it's similar to uh what the french what portu did uh for uh, the stillborn bentley corniche in that it's yeah. a a fastback uh, car, but somehow I think Lancefield, with their open car, with it's a disappearing roof, if you're able to find that, to share that, um, I think is one of the most handsome British bodied cars of its day. There you go. There it is. Yeah. yeah this one is beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So elegant. Like just if I can say something about the car that we saw before. It's really similar to the uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, Autobahn Courier yep. also from the 30s, owned by Arturo Keller, the, the car that won Amelia Island, I think, last year. So you see there is a, this kind of a strong influence between uh, you know, European countries uh, uh, on, uh, in car design in the 30s, like, like always, but that car is extremely similar to the, to the Mercedes. Beautiful example. Also this one, so elegant in the, the color combination, uh, this white and beige, uh, brownish colors, really beautiful. And there you see the, uh, the light of the proposal that um, it was all about aerodynamics. So look, just look at that side view. Yeah. Of course, the car is styled in an aerodynamic fashion with the fared in back wheels and the little speed moldings on that uh, rear wheel cover and the way the hood completely disappears. Mm -hmm. But of course, the spare wheels are hung on the side and it has the traditional big Alvis radiator and those great big headlights. It's not aerodynamic at all. It's just beautifully styled with yeah. an echo of the aerodynamic fashion. I, I think it's an absolutely sensational car. Yeah. It is. I've, I've never seen this car in, in the flesh and uh, one day, um, as a, I, I'm a Speed 25 owner myself, so I, I've, uh, I have a a slightly less beautiful um, open four-seat Tourer, but uh, this is stunning. And I think it's good to see on a car, you know, Alvis, as you know, were, were the vast majority were built to a basic uh, uh, design. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something, well, and the Bertelli as well, but this is something just completely different. I guess this is a one-off. And the back of this car reminds me of the Alpha 2.9 by Touring, uh, in a way, the open one. Yes. Yeah. Very similar, so you see, it's a very, it's kind of strange to see it on an English car, but beautiful at the same time. And to your point, Simon, this, the, the door <laughs> is the right size and shape for the car, isn't it? Yes, I mean, the, on, on uh, Duccio's point about the Alfa Touring, of course, one of the things, particularly about these small artisan coach builders, is they were completely uh, ruthless about copying each other. There was nothing wrong with copying somebody else's car. And in fact, among, between the English coach builders, if you look at some of the bodies on Derby Bentleys and uh, Phantom Three Rolls Royces, some are just a complete blatant copy of others. Mm. And I'm sure that when Lancefield, which was a pretty, pretty small operation, uh, they obviously read the autocar every week and they probably got the French and Italian magazines as well. And they were very aware of what was going on, and if they liked the look of something, they said, we'll copy that. Oh, fantastic. Let's have a look at something else, do you? Here's, no, here's a classic. Ah, oh, wonderful. So I chose the Bugatti Type 57. 
Mm. This is just beautiful. I mean, uh, one of the best expressions of, of Bugatti in the 30s and uh, everything of this car is just perfect. I, I love the, the way, you know, the suicide doors and the way the, 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 the window is, it, it, it follows the, the, the body, how it goes down and follows the line of the car. And uh, the way also this car is restored is extremely beautiful. I mean, just seeing from the picture, obviously. It's interesting that this is by Gandalf and it's therefore uh, slightly different from, from the, the design that Jean Bugatti uh, originally drew. Um, and in some ways, it's, I mean, I like it at the front because it's in a way more conventional at the front than the, yeah. uh, the, than the standard Atalant. But that long tail is absolutely wonderful. I was about to make a rude comment about the, uh, about the color until I understood that the original owner, although he didn't have this car, this color, it was um, a color that he used on one of his other Bugattis. He had several Bugattis and gave them to his sons. Uh, and one of them had this remarkable purple color. So there is a precedent, a period precedent for painting it that color. <laughs> no, it, it looks good. And if that's the original color, then that's what it should be. Mm. Yeah. I was going to, well, we'll look at something else. I was going to ask you a question, both of you actually, about this. You know, we, we, one of the other classes that we've talked about recently is preservation. And obviously, originality is important in any class. But do, in terms of the, these uh, Art Deco cars, uh, you know, originality in terms of uh, the, all the materials, the, all the, the, the parts, the panels, is just as important in this category as any other, isn't it? Oh, yes. absolutely. I, absolutely. I, originality is crucial. Um, it seems to me it's much more difficult to have a preservation car uh, when you're looking at one of the great Art Deco de la Haye's, or I mean, that wonderful de la Haye that we've got, the 165, um, one of my all-time favourites. Um, that needs, I'm afraid, to be perfectly and flawlessly restored rather than preserved, because in order to understand all the detail of how it was when it was first built, the car has to be totally restored. That may not be the same with some other cars. You look at a 1950s D-type Jaguar, for example, it's lovely to see it with the worn upholstery looking as though it's just finished doing a 24 hour race at Le Mans. Uh, but these Art Deco cars have to be, I mean, just look at that. that that's a breathtaking car. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally agree that, you know, uh... To, to have the same uh, beauty, the same level of beauty and perfection, uh, these cars uh, kind of have to be restored. Obviously, if you find them in an extremely well-preserved and well-kept uh, conditions, then you can just, you know, uh, preserve them and leave them as they are. But in general, uh, they look beauty if they are like perfect, like this, uh, this uh, Hispano Suiza by Brandon. Brandon is not uh, one of the coach builders that comes immediately to mind. They were down in the south of France, weren't they? But what I love about this car is that it's enormous. Yeah, it's huge. And yet, it's a two-seater. Well, it has a little tiny jump seat at the back. But I mean, this huge car is a two-seater. It's kind of wonderfully selfish. Uh, it makes a tremendously um, sort of decadent gesture that you should take up so much room just for yourself and your beautiful girlfriend beside you. I, it's a sensational car. Stunning. Should we just have a look at the Delahaye? The, the, was it the 39 Delahaye? Yeah, the 165. Is, is the car that I have on my t-shirt today. Yeah, I mean, that, that, <laughs> the, yes. click on that side view. There you are, yeah, it's unreal, isn't it? It's incredible. This is probably the the highest example of Art Deco uh, perfection in my in my view. It's uh, and it's based on a racing car. I mean, that's even more outstanding. So with these lines, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, it is. Well, come on, Simon. You've seen you've seen this car. What, what is it? I mean, apart from the, <laughs> it's it's um, it, it's a car that looks absolutely stunning in illustration but then when you walk onto the concourse field and you see it you just kind of 
stop dead and your mouth drops open. I yeah. mean, I'm sure if you drive it, it must feel very strange because there's, in fact, look at that yeah. picture now. You can see how narrow the front track has to be because the front wheels are covered in. And, you know, can you imagine parking that car in London? Well, you, you wouldn't, would you? You wouldn't. But <laughs> it's uh, it, just as a pure piece of art. I look at it. It's not a car to drive in just the same way that you hang a beautiful painting on the wall. This is like a painting. Yeah, it's, it's, an art piece. It's, it's made of steel and rubber and the other bits and glass, and the other bits and pieces. It is, uh, it's so over the top that you just have to stop and stare at it. It is. Yeah, don't think I'd fancy the Mili Melia in that somehow. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think Figo and Falaski here did the, the best they could. It's, it's, it is astonishing. And look at the details of the interiors too. I mean, that's Art Deco, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, this could be a furniture, a piece of furniture that you that you see in a house or or also the leather. I mean, all the details of this car is just stunning. But as you, as you said before, Simon, you know, Art Deco was, wasn't just about cars. Obviously, in fact, cars are a very small part of it. But to see yeah. links where the, with, with, to furniture within the car as well is, is very odd period. Yeah. It was wonderful to see, which Ducci had called up just a second ago, a picture, a black and white picture of the car sort of parked, um, you know, surrounded by rather ordinary looking American cars. There it is, sort yeah. of parked on a street. Um, Fantastic. Great, great car to go to Tesco's in, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the note there that uh, American bumpers were added to make the car street legal. Yes. <laughs> Extraordinary. No, brilliant. Well, well, thank you, guys. Come, come back to the full screen, Duce, if you don't mind. We'll just uh, wrap this up. It's been fun to look at the cars. I think that you know, uh, thankfully, I don't have to judge this class, but uh, they've got a huge. Well, there we go. He's he, he's declared. Yeah. 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 One six five. <laughs> were you judging that class, Duce, at Pebble Beach? Excuse were, me. Were you, were you judging the class that that Delahaye was in? No, 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 unfortunately not. But I bought this T-shirt when I went there in 2016. Mm. And I was just stunned by this car. I mean, it's oh, just, yeah. yeah, beautiful. Well, I think, I think the judges have a tough job. I mean, every class is full of great cars. <clears throat> but I think the Art Deco class in particular has got some astonishing cars, you know, Pebble Beach winners as, as well. Um, so I think it's going to be a tough call. And of course, the public have a vote too. So we can look forward to seeing what the public think. And uh, Duccio has already declared what he wants them to click on when they go on to the, to the website. But uh, Duccio, Simon, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been very good chatting to you, looking at some of the cars. I'm going to stop the recording in just a moment and then we can just wrap, wrap up. So thanks again, guys. Thank you.